our last presentation, Professor Jeffrey Liebman. Jeff, you are welcome. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to speak to you this afternoon. Um, I have visited uh, St. Petersburg, not yet the rest of the country, and I look forward to doing that at some point in the future. This is a uh, wonderful uh, meeting so far, and again, thank you for the invitation. I'm going to speak about uh, progression, but also about ocular perfusion and the phenotypes that we sometimes see in glaucoma. Here are my disclosures. We're fortunate to have a lot of instruments in our laboratory and a lot of support. As you heard from the other speakers this morning, glaucoma is a progressive optic neuropathy. Um, it is really a disease that, that begins at the laminar crebrosa, where there are retinal ganglion cells uh, injured, um, along with their axons, uh, and the, the, the appearance of the disc begins to change. But of course, there are pressure-dependent and pressure-independent components to the disease process. In this picture of the optic nerve, there are two optic disc splinter hemorrhages, which are suggestive of future visual field and optic nerve damage. This is a cartoon from an article by Bob Weinreb and Peng Ka that appeared in Lancet nearly 15 years ago. And it describes all of the factors that might affect retinal ganglion cell health, including elevated intraocular pressure, which interferes with axonal transport um, at the lamina cabrosa, um, changes that occur to glial tissues, of course, genetics, possibly immune dysfunction, but, but importantly, both the microcirculation at the level of the optic nerve head and ocular perfusion. So do these vascular susceptibility factors define phenotypic differences? Now, phenotypic differences can be both systemic and ocular. I'd like to address the ocular phenotypes first. Of course, the ocular phenotypes are familiar to us. We see those as uh, apparent, the, the optic nerve appearance. This is related perhaps to myopia or focal ischemic events near the optic disc or senile sclerotic disc appearances. But also the disc hemorrhage I showed you earlier and there, of course, there are other anatomic features that make the disc susceptible to damage. The appearance of the optic disc, of course, over time um, has been evaluated. Um, these are images from nearly uh, 20 years ago or 30 years ago now, looking at focal change in the optic disc, where the, the focal ischemic type of change inferiorly in the optic disc on your left compared to the uh, more generalized loss of axons that's related to higher intraocular pressure. On the right part of the screen is work by Dr. Drantz, um, looking at the four major types of disc change, um, focal ischemic change, uh, myopic change, senile sclerotic change, and just a general atrophic disc. Of course, none of these occurs by themselves, and many of the discs that we see have this mis mixed type of appearance. One of the most common features of the optic disc that occurs is the appearance of a disc hemorrhage. We see here a uh, nerve fiber layer defect and an inferior notch. Over time, uh, that inferior notch can develop a, uh, a disc hemorrhage. This is the most common location for a disc hemorrhage. It's occurring in the macular vulnerability zone described by Dr. Hood that points to the inferior macular region and the superior paracentral visual field region. It's critically important for patients uh, in, in their ability to function. Many years later on your right, uh, this patient has developed a notch nearly all the way to the inferior rim at the site of the prior notch and the disc hemorrhage, which signaled that progression was going to occur. Disc hemorrhage, is very important uh, throughout the glaucoma spectrum, not just in patients what, with normal tension glaucoma, but even in patients with ocular hypertension. In the ocular hypertension treatment study, the hazard ratio for developing visual field or optic nerve progression after a disc hemorrhage 
was approximately 3.7. This is very similar to Dr. Drance and Anderson's collaborative normal tension glaucoma treatment study, where the hazard ratio was approximately three. So regardless of the type of glaucoma, whether it's ocular hypertension, advanced primary open angle glaucoma, normal tension glaucoma, um, or low tension glaucoma, the, the presence of a disc hemorrhage is a strong predictor of future loss. These disc, these disc hemorrhages um, are thought to be related to changes in the lamina cribrosa. As the lamina beams degenerate, little blood vessels break, the blood, the blood is then, then moves forward um, in the nerve fiber layer, and we see it as that classic nerve fiber layer hemorrhage. Um, in our laboratory, and work done by Bal Chahan and his team, has demonstrated that there is a relationship between these laminar degeneration processes and the disc hemorrhages. Um, in this image um, on the upper left, at the blue arrow is a disc hemorrhage, and the uh, red arrow shows an acquired pit of the optic nerve head. On the upper right, we can see that that acquired pit of the optic nerve head corresponds in its enhanced depth imaging OCT image to a laminar disinsertion. In the bottom left image, we see that disinsertion reconstructed three-dimensionally. The light blue circle is Brooks membrane opening. And in the center lower panel and the right lower corner, we can see that the disc hemorrhage is occurring right at the edge of that laminar disinsertion and degeneration, suggesting that tissue breakdown at that location is responsible for the development of the disc hemorrhage. Parapapillary atrophy is also associated with, in eyes with perhaps decreased perfusion or myopia. Here's a patient with a disc hemorrhage and parapapillary atrophy. The disc hemorrhage is occurring in the area of the widest parapapillary atrophy. Parapapillary atrophy also can increase in time. Um, if we photograph patients over a very long period of time, we can see that expansion often accompanies the change in the thickness of the nerve fiber layer and the width of the neural retinal rim. Along with colleagues here, um, and Gustavo de Moraes looking at a database of 40,000 patients at 140,000 fields, we see that both disc hemorrhage and beta zone parapapillary atrophy at the bottom of this chart, both are independent risk factors for disease progression and need to be inspected in every glaucoma patient. So in addition to those optic nerve phenotypes, there are perfusion abnormalities of the optic nerve and of course, difference in eye intraocular pressure range. Um, in the past, um, the uh, ocular perfusion was measured um, more grossly with things like fluorescein angiography. But in the, on, in the image on your right, the use of optical coherence tomography and geography is now increasing our understanding of the area around the optic disc and the nerve cells and axons that might be affected by alterations in ocular perfusion. Of course, we're all familiar with OCT and geography now with uh, better perfusion in the left image than in the right image in the patient with advanced glaucoma damage. Ultimately, of course, we want more measures of optic nerve and retinal function not just the perfusion. And there is a lot of research uh, going on to try to evaluate the oxygenation and nutritional status of the retina. And we look forward to uh, much more research in this area that will perhaps create an early biomarker for disease. But what about the systemic phenotypes? What about systemic findings in glaucoma? We all know that there are many cardiovascular risk factors for the disease including systemic hypotension, low blood pressure, low blood pressure at night. There is some evidence that treating patients with high blood pressure and making the blood pressure too low with treatment might be worse for patients. Patients with cardiac diseases such as atrial fibrillation and decreased perfusion don't do as well. 
Um, patients with stroke may have altered central nervous system perfusion. There are a whole series of articles on vascular dysregulation, um, including, including vasospasm, migraine, and Raynaud's phenomenon that all predict uh, glaucoma onset and progression. I would like to bring your attention to one article um, that was recently published in the New England Journal of Medicine um, related to intensive versus standard blood pressure control called the SPRINT trial. Um, before I get to that, though, I just wanted to review a little bit about what we know about systemic blood pressure and ocular perfusion pressure and glaucoma prevalence. No matter which population-based survey we look at, whether it's the Baltimore Eye Survey, which looked at European versus African-derived individuals, the Egner Newmark study, which looked at Europeans, Proyecto Ver, which looked at people with Latino ancestry, in all of those populations, lower blood pressure, whether you measure that systolically, diastolically, or by mean perfusion pressure, increased the prevalence um, of disease and risk for disease. These three graphs illustrate that finding. On the left side of each graph is a lower diastolic perfusion pressure. And we can see that the lower diastolic perfusion pressure, the higher the risk of developing glaucoma. So the lower your blood pressure, the higher the risk in every population study. Um, at the opposite end of the spectrum, if the blood pressure is very high, there probably is some increased risk as well, um, but, grip, but the risk is greatly increased by reduced blood pressure. Even if we look at a uh, primarily, primarily African ancestry in, uh, population, such as in Barbados, where there's a high prevalence and incidence of glaucoma, it is absolutely true that higher pressure is important uh, for the development of the disease. Higher intraocular pressure is important, but lower systolic, lower diastolic, and lower mean perfusion pressures also greatly increase the risk with the relative risk of approximately three with lower uh, pressure, systemic blood pressures in each of those categories. So it's very important to understand and recognize the fact that in each of these population groups, as, as highlighted in pink here in the Barbados Eye Survey, that whether it's systolic, diastolic, or mean perfusion pressure, however you want to look at it, there's a greatly increased risk of disease. This looks at mean ocular perfusion pressure in the Los Angeles Latino Eye Survey. And again, we see that typical U-shaped curve with a much greater incidence of glaucoma onset with lower perfusion pressure. In the Thessaloniki Eye Survey in Greece, um, in a subgroup analysis, the patients who were treated uh, for their systemic hypertension appeared to have a greater chance of developing glaucoma progression uh, when they were treated for their systemic hypertension. So we need to be careful with respect, with respect to blood pressure management. This was also true in the low tension glaucoma treatment study where the use of antihypertensive medications increased the risk of developing glaucoma, more, glaucoma progression more than twofold. So there are many studies now to support that. We have evaluated nocturnal systemic hypotension along with colleagues uh, at New York Eye Infirmary with Bob Rich, um, uh, Gustavo de Moraes now here at Columbia, um, and Mary Charlson at Cornell University, in which we performed 48-hour blood pressure monitoring. And during that time, when the patient wore the blood pressure cuff for 48 straight hours, the duration and magnitude of the reduction in mean arterial blood pressure was associated with visual field progression. And that was an important feature of the, that disease process. Subsequent to that, there was an article in the American Journal of Hypertension in which they performed a meta-analysis of all of this literature and concluded that it was important to, for a prospective trial to be performed in ophthalmology to look at the role of blood pressure and blood pressure control in glaucoma. That brings us back to the SPRINT trial, the Systolic Blood Pressure Intervention Trial, which was published now three years ago 
Its objective was to try to determine the best blood pressure treatments for patients. That was a randomized prospective trial. Now, in the United States, the standard treatment is to reduce systolic blood pressure to less than 140. In this study, they used every available means to reduce it to less than 120 millimeters of mercury for all patients. They use an outcome measure that we don't use in ophthalmology, of course. We use progression, but they use major events such as myocardial infarction or stroke. And they found that by lowering blood pressure intensively, this is, these are patients across the age spectrum, by in very intensive blood pressure monitor, by blood pressure control, fewer patients actually died. So they want our internal medicine colleagues are seeking to lower blood pressure even more aggressively than they currently are. Now that is important for patients' longevity, but no eye disease parameters were studied in this trial. So they're lowering blood pressure in patients with glaucoma very aggressively now, and this is going to impact our glaucoma patients. So in the United States, these results are going to affect 16 million Americans. And it's, we have tremendous concern now about end organ perfusion and how it's going to affect the eye. This is going to cause more patients to have nocturnal blood pressure dips. Now, a lot of patients, many patients with glaucoma also have hypertension, particularly in minority populations. So we have to caution and work with our internal medicine colleagues to uh, treat these patients uh, with caution. And we need to communicate as ophthalmologists with our internal medicine colleagues to make sure that they're being treated correctly. So how, what does this mean for us practically? Well, I think we need to consider ocular perfusion during the evaluation of subjects with glaucoma. We need to carefully obtain a history of systemic hypertension and its treatment, um, systemic or nocturnal hypotension, vasospasm and other forms of vascular dysregulation. We need to work with our internal medicine colleagues to take care of our patients. We also have to continue consider minimizing the use of vasoactive drugs, such as topical beta blockers, particularly in the evening. You know, in this symposium, you have heard a great deal about all the wonderful things that are occurring in terms of, of glaucoma. But throughout the field of, of ophthalmology, the use of genetics, big data, artificial intelligence, careful diagnosis are really revolutionizing uh, the care very rapidly. We all need to stay abreast of these wonderful changes in our field, which are going to uh, tremendously benefit our patients and uh, the training of future ophthalmologists. So I want to thank you for your attention. It's been wonderful to uh, visit with you this afternoon and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you.